Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. It's been a funny day um, because the Wi-Fi at my house hasn't been working very well. So every time I tried to get into uh, my iPad uh, and open a file, it would say, uh, not allowed, download not allowed, you need permission from the owner. And I'm screaming at the thing, I am the owner, let me in. Oh, it wasn't going to let me. So it's been one of those days where I wasn't even sure that I would get up tonight and be able to have any notes, so it's not been uh, very comfortable. At, um, this is where I want to start tonight. Are you aware that the end of the world was supposed to be today? Who knew? Put your hand up if you knew. Oh, a few, a few. Now, don't you find that amazing? That it's come and it's gone. Oh, a few, oh, okay, a few seven hours left. I, I think we're almost quite confident to say that nothing's going to happen. Besides, as they were saying in Australia, it's almost, it's already been and gone anyway. <clears throat> now, the reason why I just want to start by saying that is that basically, if you're a Christian and hold to what you call mainstream Christian beliefs, then you should, and some of you haven't even thought about it or even know about it, so we don't make a big thing of it in this, in this place, but the, basically, um, the we believe in the second coming uh, and are what's called the rapture and that all of a sudden uh, everybody who believes is going to be taken up off the earth and everybody who doesn't is going to be destroyed and it's going to be horrible and this, that and the other. And apparently, according to the predictions and prophecies of the Bible, that was supposed to happen today. Now, um, what's really funny, that if you're a Christian as well, astrom astrology... We're not supposed to have anything to do with because the reading of the stars and all that is a no-no. Come on, are you with me or not? Or are you looking at me as though, uh? It's not supposed to be a thing you do. I mean, as a child or as a young person, if I ever looked at the stars horoscope in the newspaper, oh boy, was I in trouble. Anybody with me? Yeah, okay. But just think about it. Guess what they are going on with regards to the end of the world. The aligning of the planets. So I think to myself, well, there you go. Just shows you how people speak with forked tongue. Because on the one hand, they say, don't look at the stars. And then the next breath, they're following the stars. So there was an alignment of planets today. But then, of course, this guy who said, it's going to happen. Uh, he's now saying, no, it's in October. So you've got a bit longer. So anyway, now, why have I said that? Is because there are certain interpretations that organize, oh, institution, organizations, whatever word you want to use, come to, and they, it can be incredibly confusing. And, and that's why we have the lab on a Wednesday night, because we try to tackle this stuff. I'm not saying that we get all the right answers, but what we do, <coughs> excuse me, is that we at least bring it out onto the table and say, look, this is what certain things say, this is what people interpret it as being, and, uh, you know, it will at least bring some clarity, a little bit more clarity, clarity to it all. So on Wednesday night, I'm going to deal with some more of this stuff. We've already tackled uh, a bit about the devil, and we've tackled about the Bible. We've tackled about a lot of stuff, and uh, this Wednesday night, we're going to tackle a bit more. See, this thing called the rapture, and I'm not talking about this tonight, but I'm just telling you, just, this is for free. This thing called the rapture and this thing called the second coming. Second coming is not mentioned in the Bible once. Where has it come from? It came from a guy in the rapture called uh, J.R.N. Darby. And it was in the uh, uh, early 1900s that he suddenly came up with this idea. And since then, this theory has been widely used. And what does it do? It terrifies people. Absolutely terrifies people, but we've just been singing, your love never fails. Now, just think about that for one minute. If that's the truth, what does it serve destroying 
an incredible creation. I don't get it. I can understand there being a separation of what you might call the good and the bad. But why destroy a world that's pretty awesome without the people who mess it up? And yet it's all going to burn with fire and brimstone and it's all really doomsday stuff. You think, that doesn't sound such a good idea to me. And then we pin that on this God who we say loves us with an everlasting love. And then somehow in the background we're holding on to this idea of, of destruction. And, and Do you get me? We've got to be honest with ourselves. What is it that we really uh, believe about the one who we say loves us with an everlasting love? Do you agree? And I think that's what we're doing uh, on a Wednesday night. So I am going to sort of talk about uh, uh, that a bit, bit more. Not the rapture per se, but actually I'll tell you it's going to be about the lake of fire. I'm going to go into that. It's going to be fun. Really fun. Okay. Um, I really felt uh, tonight as we've been singing about, you know, all things work together for my good. You know, you can... Can, I can get really, really nervous because sometimes I know the things that we say don't always line up with what we're experiencing. And that can be uncomfortable. And I know faith takes us beyond that uncomfortableness, but it doesn't get rid of the, almost a, a contradiction at times. If I might just be honest, there are things that are happening in our lives that we think, this is what my experience is supposed to be, but that's not what's happening. Now, am I right? Are you with me? And I don't want to be foolish. I want to be faithful, and I want to give hope and encouragement, but I think there's times when we have actually swallowed a doctrine that's not really very helpful. Uh, it's almost like, you know... Most of you would agree that when you look on the TV and you watch the prosperity preachers who are telling you that basically you should be rich and there should be never a problem, you should never not have enough money, you think to yourself, that can't be right when half the world is starving. Just can't be right. And it just doesn't sit well, does it? And so you'd say there's something not quite right with that. So you look to find what is the truth amongst it all. And I think sometimes that uh, you know, I want to be very sensitive when we talk about things like suffering. When, when people are suffering, we say, oh, you shouldn't be suffering because God is for you. But people suffer. People are suffering. You've only seen uh, over the world over these last uh, few weeks that the, the, um, the floods, the earthquakes, and of course, that's what people look at and say, oh, this is it. The end of the world is coming because these things are happening. No, we've got such things as hurricanes and, and, and stuff that's out of our control and yet we pin it down. Oh, this is God, this is God. No, but people are suffering and we've got to be very sensitive when we start then talking about things. Now, I felt that I wanted to give a, a bit of a modern day par a parable because Jesus used to use stories when, when he spoke uh, to people around him and I think at times he used these stories Possibly because they were true. Um, I'd like to think that when he sat down and he said there was a certain farmer, I like to think that when, he, when the story started to unfold, people said, oh, that's him up, up there. You know, old Joe, whatever. And they began to be able to put together the piece, the, the, the story, and, and from it take... It, from it what would touch their heart and bring some truth into their hearts. Now, over this last uh, few weeks, I could uh, tell you a modern parable about a certain mother and a certain child over in that corner, and they're not aware I'm talking about them. And I could tell you a story that would open up your eyes and, and, and you could learn something from that parable and that story. And... Um, there's another story that I want to tell tonight, and it's about a certain landlord and certain tenants, and they happen to be mine. <laughs> and uh, the parable I'm going to tell you is true, and in it, I, and it's not these two, no, it's not these two. Um, it's really been uh, 
a, a great uh, eye-opener to me. Now, there's lots of things that happen to us every day, and I don't know if you're like me. I, I don't suppose many are. I know I'm a bit of a, a weirdo. Um, but I find that things that are happening on a regular basis... I believe that God is talking to me <laughs> all the time. He's showing me stuff and he's, he's showing me his heart for me through just everyday things all the time. And um, a few, before we went away on holiday, we knew that we were going to have to deal uh, with uh, this house that we bought 12 years ago about. And uh, it was a student let at the time. And... Uh, uh, it was coming towards the end of its contract and uh, the students were all leaving and it was in a pretty bad state but we thought it's okay what we'll do when they go out we'll get in we'll do it up and then we'll open it up for for student less again and uh, that didn't happen because we had a situation where a, a family came into the church and uh, they were in real real need and they didn't have uh, much money and they didn't have much possessions that come out of a situation that was pretty uh, dire and uh, they heard that we had this place and they said can we look at it and because their family was big this was this is a three-story house it was perfect for them and we said oh but it's it's pretty bad it's manky and they said no it, it's really okay and they said you know what what's the rent I said well in the present conditions that it is the rent's low oh that's great but we haven't got any bond, and oh, well, that's all right. We, we want to help you. And so we actually, uh, out of a kindness, gave the, the house to this family, and uh, they were in it for quite a long time. And then um, things really didn't go well, and so that there was there's problems in the, their marriage, and so they moved on. But then the kids wanted to stay. But then the kids weren't doing very well financially. They didn't have jobs. There was problems. So... We didn't often get our rent and there was, you know, issues to, to deal with there. But we just thought we'd be kind and wanted to help. And um, then it goes on and uh, some people moved, extra people moved in. But they wouldn't pay rent because they said the place is so filthy. We're not going to pay rent for a place that's filthy. And we're saying, yes, but the rent is right down there. Because it's really not very good. And it's not filthy because we've made it filthy. It's filthy because that's how you've chosen. Oh, I know this sounds awful, doesn't it? But I'm just trying to give you a bit of a, a backstory. And so we're in this situation where finally we had to say, oh, we've got to do something here. We, we really have. And so we decided to end the contract. And uh, the, the, everybody's gone now and we're left with this place. So when we got back from holiday, we had to face it. And uh, I am not kidding you. We walked through the door and um, it, it really was terrible. I mean, if, if I, th now these are not criticisms. I, I, I hope you hear me. All I'm trying to do is paint the picture. Because what I'm doing with this modern day parable is just maybe describe a mess. <laughs> and then apply it to your situation and think, oh, I wonder. Uh, this place, it, it was just shocking. And not only... Um, was it obviously we had to clean it but first of all we had to clear it because they'd left everything and uh, clothes that they'd, they'd left and um, I, I just can't even begin to tell you what it was like rubbish I don't think they've ever put put rubbish out in the last however many years bag after bag after bag and of course bags start to rot and then where they've been stood it's rotting the walls and it, I, I hope you're getting a picture it was really, really awful. And um, I had a bit of a, a bad feeling about it all because, of course, previously we'd been blamed that, oh, you know, the reason it's so bad is it's your fault. And we're saying, well, I didn't, I didn't eat the pizza that's in the empty boxes that's in the middle of your lounge floor. Yeah? But it's the landlords that's the problem. Are you getting how silly it goes? And, we, and, and you get the picture that we start to, to blame. But what was, what was nice, we got this lovely letter uh, off uh, one of the tenants who thanked us for all our, for our years of kindness, and, which just sounds lovely, doesn't it? It's great. Oh, thank you for being so understanding. 
And we were glad to do that because we felt it was a gift that we were being to these, uh, these people. But then, of course, when we got there and we saw uh, furniture in the middle of the backyard, uh, there was even... Uh, wardrobes on the kitchen roof. There's a flat roof kitchen at the back. I don't know how those wardrobes had got onto that roof, but somehow they'd, they'd found a way, all because they didn't know what to do with certain stuff. They just found a way of sort of <laughs> pushing it out of the way. It was just unbelievable. And I know I just felt, oh, this is, this is absolutely awful because it's, it's not my mess. But there's, a, there's an issue here. It was my house. And if it's my house, I've got to own that mess. I, are you with me? And, and I just feel right at this point, I have to say to some of you, you're suffering so badly, not because you've made the mess. You might think somebody else is responsible. But the problem is it's your house. And sometimes things that are going on in you have been created by somebody else but it's your house so you can either say that's it I'm leaving it I'm not I'm having now to do with this or you say I'm gonna get down I'm gonna face this I'm gonna tackle it and get on and and do it is this this making sense so we got in there now what is absolutely incredible is it might have taken many years to get to that place and do you know there's absolute many reasons why things end up in a state like that. It's not out of malice. It's not out of nastiness. It's just it wasn't a priority. I think to myself, you know, well, you know, the young lads, they've been out, they've been doing what they're doing and they come in and then they watch telly and they get on the Xbox and they're doing all this. And all they can think about is the pizza, getting to bed, they get up on the morning, they go back out and that's it. Is the malice there? No. But at the end of the day, we get this, we get this, uh, what do you call it, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And all of a sudden you realise it's absolutely overwhelming and you don't know where, where to start. I mean, there was a Monica cupboard. You know what a Monica cupboard is? Or friends? The ones who are laughing, no. You open the door <laughs> and you lean back because you expect it all to fall on you. I mean, literally right under the stairs, jam-packed right into the corner. It was unbelievable and, um, you know, it could have been left. Now, listen, when we talk like this and we talk about that house, this house, it can be left, you know. It really can and, and I don't want anybody in this place to, uh, and I know we don't do it. We never stand up here and tell you you must be certain things. We don't. We leave that uh, to the Holy Spirit to deal with, with you in, in, in your heart. And the truth is, if you want to leave stuff, you can, because I believe what we've been singing about your love never fails. You are okay just as you are. Now, you, some people find that really wrong to say, but I'm, I'm saying it now. You are okay as you are. The only problem is all those layers of things that have affected you and made your house what it is, is actually burying potential that's the problem. You, you, it's okay, but for your sake, it's burying, burying potential. See, I know that that house is amazing, but you can't see it. You just can't see it at all. So until somebody gets in there, and I'll tell you what, just to cut quite a, a, a long story short, we'd only been in there three days, and already the difference was unbelievable. So I want to encourage you right from this point. Things that you... Uh, sometimes don't want to face in your life because you think it's just too much. It might have taken years to get where you've got, but in three days, you might be able to turn it around. Now, isn't that wonderful news? Because some people say, oh, well, you know, when I was a child, this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and we've got 30 years of, of experience of all this accumulation of stuff. How can I ever put it right? The truth is, probably in three days, maybe it's one day, you can. But you have to face it, and you have to get down. Now, the awful thing about this is, I have a bit of a queasy stomach, and uh, our Connie will tell you, she laughs at me. But I get to the point where certain things make me gip. 
I, know, I knew you'd laugh, and I, I, I aren't telling you this to make you laugh, but it's just the truth. And um, I was actually using a, a, a wallpaper scraper to get fat. <coughs> I'm doing it already. It was horrible, seriously. And you know, you, you, are you gipping as well? And I'd put the wallpaper scraper down the side of, of the sink and it would catch all this gloop. And our Connie would be hearing me. She was in the bathroom helping me. And uh, I'd, I'd start to cough and it was making me want to vomit because I really struggle with that sort of thing. So it wasn't that I was cleaning this house and it was all great. Oh, yeah, come on. Literally, I'm holding on to my stomach because it was, it was so horrible. And then, you know, you think to yourself, how does food get on a ceiling? I just don't get it. How does food get on a ceiling? Come on. I bet somebody knows. But anyway, I don't know where I am now. Um... The, the truth is, it, it was, and as I was doing it, I really felt God was talking to me. He says, yeah, he says, you're doing it and you're willing. He says, but you're really suffering, aren't you? This is making you suffer. And I thought, yeah. Uh, now, some of you will say that's not suffering. There's real suffering in the world. But, you know, I, I really find that unfair. Whatever you are going through, that's your problem and we talked about this the other day. I always used to love Ali McBeal when uh, somebody said to her, what makes your problems bigger than everybody else's? And she said, because they're mine. And I think that that's one of the most wisest things anybody can tell you. Don't let anybody undermine your problems. They are yours and that's what makes them important. Now, it doesn't make them insurmountable or greater than anybody else's, but they're yours. Do you, do you get me? So I'm suffering all of this, and I really actually felt that God started to talk to me. And uh, as I was dealing with what I saw was grime, not dust, but grime, layer upon layer. And the point was, when I added water, and my mum always used to say, you know, you let the water do the work. Who's ever heard of that? That's quite an old-fashioned state. Let the water... So you student ishy people over here, when you're cleaning, don't just get a cloth and think, mm, let the water do the work. Because if you let the water soak in, it literally lifts it for you. And then you have... You don't, you don't. Anyway... So I'm letting the water do the work. The only problem is, as I was letting the water do the work, it's getting more sludgy. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it was horrible. Anyway, and I really felt that uh, in it all, in all of this, I felt that God started to speak to me. And he, he, I got this verse, and you might think, oh, that's very, you know, hyper-spiritual. But I did, I got this verse. And it's the verse that says that Jesus learned obedience by that which he suffered. Now, immediately, I think to myself, it can't mean obedience in the context of do as you're told. It just can't. Because if we're saying that Jesus was the Son of God, although he was a man, I believe that he wasn't the rebellious type that was going to say, oh, I ain't going to do what you tell me. I think that he was open and he was, you know, on the journey and being willing to, 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 to be open. So it can't have been Jesus had to suffer a whole bunch of stuff in order to make him submit to what the Father wanted. Does that make sense? I don't see that as being the case. Um, I don't believe he had to be forced into submission. Now, obedience actually means this. It means, and I, and I love this because I know I was brought up that obedience was the most important thing in the world. And I, I don't think it is anymore. And that's for another time. But it, this is what obedience means. It means hear intelligently. Think of that. Hear intelligently and stand under another's wisdom. That's very different than just do as you're told. Because actually what it means is, is if you're stood standing under another person's wisdom and you listen to it and you think that's not wise, you don't actually have to obey it. Think about that. 
because that would be foolish. But you stand under another's wisdom. And when you hear that higher wisdom, you operate in it and it changes your attitude and your way of, of, of being. So what is the wisdom then that Jesus was open to and hearing intelligently uh, through the things which he suffered? I think that he heard, I can endure, I can overcome, and I can have restoration in all things. Shall I say that again? What is the wisdom that he was hearing intelligently? And uh, what was the other one I said? Uh, standing under another's wisdom. It was he could endure, he could overcome, and there could be restoration. Why? Because he was involved. Right? Now, let me bring it back into this issue of this house this, this last week. What was it that I learned through that which I was suffering? I learned that I could endure, that I could overcome, and that there could be restoration. Why? Because I was involved. Can you say that about your situation that you're in? I think obedience has a deeper meaning. It's how to be. In any situation that we're in, we are learning in that which we're going through how to be. And what really came to me was this, that in surrendering to mystery, he was at one with a higher wisdom that he might not have particularly understood, but he was willing to embrace it. And he had an appreciation of the part that he was playing in the restoration of all things. And then it suddenly came to me, I thought, right, what is really going on in this context of him being obedient? And it just fell into my mind that he learned how to be a conduit of grace to the world. Now I think a conduit, where did that come from, a conduit? If you look it up, all it means is a channel for the conveying of water. Don't you think that's lovely? A channel for the conveying of water. He learned obedience. He learned to be a channel in whatever situation he was in, in order to convey grace to the world, wherever he was. And I'm asking the question, when you're suffering, what is it that you're learning? I don't know. Some of us say, oh, oh, all I'm learning is that I don't like it. So, I know when our Joel lost his suitcase this week, he was suffering. Weren't you, babe? Be honest. He was suffering. Do you know his entire world was in that case? It was. Hey, you think I'm being funny? I said, your problems are your problems. And they, yeah, they were his problems. His world was in that suitcase. He mattered. He gave me. What did you learn by what you suffered? Now, I'm see, picking you out, babe. I'm sorry. But you see what I mean? See what I mean, though? If we don't learn something in what we are suffering, then what was the point? What was the point? I'm hoping you've learned something. I said to him, well, trust. Oh, we don't like to trust, do we? Most of the time. Nah, I want it sorted. I want it sorted now. We've got to trust. Now, um, in Luke 9.51, there's a, there's a verse, and it blessed me this morning as I read, and it says this, Jesus set his face as a flint towards Jerusalem. Now, that again just did something for me, because I'm thinking, yeah, there's a, there's a determination there that decides that he's going to face the situation. He, he set his face but to face the place that was actually representation of suffering and death, but he set his face towards it. And um, as I was thinking about it, um, flint is a very hard type of rock. And of course, I'm thinking I like these thoughts. First of all, I, I like the idea that Jenny and Dave were called flint toft. Isn't that just wonderful? Apply it. You know, it's great. And then it's a hard type of sedimentary rock. And I'm thinking, 
the rock of York. <laughs> you know, I'm just tying it all together who we are. But listen to this. When struck against steel, a flint edge produces sparks to start a fire. Setting your face as a flint implies that you are expecting some type of opposition that you must stand strong in the face of. But to set your face as a flint means to regard these difficulties as worthwhile when you consider what they will lead to. Now, that's the problem. We don't see suffering as worthwhile as we're moving towards the thing that we want. We see all these things as opposition rather than this is worthwhile. Now, I know you're looking at me all funny because you're thinking, I don't like this. Uh, I, but think about it. When Flint the Rock hits the steel, which you could call determination, it creates a fire of purpose and a belief in the role of the restoration that I'm playing a part in if I'll only stand firm, right? But, of course, we say, well, yeah, but Jesus was going towards Jerusalem. It was his death. Now, I am of the absolute uh, opinion that um, you can't have life without death. And most of the time, we hold on to the struggle because we believe that letting go of the struggle will kill us, but the struggle is going to kill us. Do you get that? So we think we're safe with the struggle that we're in because we say, well, if I let go, all the, the unknown, all the, the issues will just overwhelm me and it will kill me. But we don't recognize that the struggle will kill us anyway. So it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured. And he endured because he knew he was partaking as someone who was a conduit in the restoration of all things. So I've got a picture that I want to put up just very quickly because I, this came to me in the context of the flint. And it says this, I survived because the fire inside of me burned brighter than the fire around me. That's powerful stuff. It's powerful. It's brilliant. Thank you. It's brilliant. That's the flint hitting the steel that sets the spark of determination and fire of purpose in our beings that causes us to get down and deal with the grime. Even though we gip in, we do it in order that we can get through and the fire around us is not as great as the, I think of the three Hebrew lads. It's great, isn't it? You think, what? what? When they were thrown in the fire, they didn't notice the fire around them because of what was in them, right? So I hope that you just keep that in your spirit because that really blessed me today. So some of you have been suffering all week. Some of you are, uh, have had a tough time. And uh, whether it be with physical issues, emotional issues, whatever, the point is I'm trying to help you set your face as a flint. Let it hit some steel and let it make a fire within you that will burn brighter than the fire around you. Are you, are you hearing me? Please, somebody say, I'm going to try. Please. It would be nice. Okay. Um, here's the thing. Richard Rower, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know, he's a, he's a, a, a Catholic um, Franciscan monk, I believe, but I don't know for sure. But he, he, he writes some incredible things, and he talks a lot about suffering. And he says this, and uh, I thought it was really helpful. He said, suffering of some sort seems to be the only thing strong enough to both destabilize and reveal. Now, see where it's revealing? It's awful. Our arrogance, our separateness, and our lack of compassion. Now, you might think, oh, no it, no, it doesn't. But if you put this in another way, we tend to suffer whenever we're not in control. When we can't control stuff, or when we think people are doing this or that, or, they, or the mess is somebody else's responsibility, or this shouldn't be happening to me, we suffer because we're not in 
control. Yet, what he goes on to say, suffering seems an effective way to get humans to learn to trust and give up control. Oh, heck. So you could almost say that I'm going to probably have to suffer far more the more I want to be in control. Ooh. Oh, dear. All right. Here we go. If we do not transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it. So if we don't take the suffering, like Jesus did, he learned obedience, and we said it wasn't obedience being told what to do and not to do, but how to be a conduit of grace to the world, then instead of it being a sacred wound, it will become a bitter wound. Now, bitter wounds we have got to be safe from. Sacred wounds become a channel of grace to the world. So, I want to ask the question, am I learning to be a conduit of grace to the world by what I suffer? Ooh. And will I set my face as a flint and let a fire start that takes me all the way to the restoration of all things, redemption and resurrection. Has that made sense? I hope so. Now, I know it's a bit of a modern day parable, but I promise you, I didn't want to do that work in that house. I've got, I've got a bit of a bad back, of course, on the floor and you're up and down and it's all hard work. And at the end of it, I realised, you know what? This is amazing. I said to Anthony at the end, I said, have you changed some light bulbs in here? And he said, no, why? Just the cleaning up of the grime changed the light within the house. Just getting rid of the rubbish changed the light in the house. Don't you think that's amazing? Now, as I said at the beginning, some of you, you might say, ah, no big deal. I'm quite happy as I am. I've lived with all my stuff all this time, I can live with it a little bit longer. But remember what we said, it's not about whether you have to, it's whether your potential is being so buried and it will ultimately cause you to suffer more because you will not be able to be that conduit of grace to the world. So I hope that's helpful. And uh, I'm done. And... Um, I always think of the wounds of, of Jesus in his hands. He, 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 he showed them, didn't he, to, uh, was it Thomas? And he said, put your finger in there. And uh, I, I think, I don't know whether Anth pinched it off somebody else or whether it was his own thought, but he talked about wounds with no pain because he was willing to have the wound touched. So that suffering that he had experienced at the hands of, 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 of evil men who were so brutal in their uh, treatment of him, after the event, he wasn't bitter. He was actually holding them as a, as a sacred thing that, that says this means something. It means something. And there was no pain within it. So let our suffering teach us obedience. Teach us what we are the part that we're playing in the restoration of things. Do you know, I helped restore that house. Some of you think, well, that's no big deal. To me, it's a wonderful thing because I'm only going to live once and I am making sure that the stuff I am doing has got some significance. Isn't that amazing? Significance. Yeah? Now, remember that dust often we think is insignificant. You know, if you let your, your dust build up for a week, it's not that important, is it? If you let it build up two weeks, you can start to write your name. If you build it up a couple of months, you see what I mean? It's not easy to wipe off then. You need water. Following me. And in your life, always be thinking, what is it that I need the water of the, of the, of, of the revelation of truth whether it be from friends or whether it be from something that you're reading to help deal with, with that build-up because we don't want our potential to be buried, do we? And we want light to shine. So, we're done. 
Now we're going to take the offering, are we? Offering. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. Then why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.